supposedly without um, looking at um, the person, him or herself, individual merit is the only criterion for success. Um, in this positivistic um, conception of uh, doing academic work, it is deemed that the person of the academic, of the student, of the researcher, um, doesn't hold any value at all. So what we see happening here is that two processes are set in motion by this assumption that it is individual merit that counts as the most important uh, criterion for where you wind up. So on the one side, it produces a discourse with regard to members of ethnic minority groups that can be seen as the deficit model. This model has been laid out in the Netherlands, for instance, by Filomena Asset and Kwame Nimago. This discourse, this, this deficit model, places black migrant and refugee students and um, teachers in the position that they have a serious problem. They are the ones who need to catch up. Um, they have to integrate into the Dutch system. And the system is deemed to be perfect, to be uh, sorting people according to their qualifications and qualities. Um, if black migrant and refugee students and teachers are not coming into the academy in, uh, in, in uh, numbers that would be uh, referring to their presence in the total population, then it has to do with their lack of intellectual qualities, their lack of intellectual skills, lack of motivation, um, maybe also um, arrears in linguistic possibilities, maybe they have a lack of support uh, from their families, um, but the system is all right. It is the black migrant refugee students and teachers who are the ones that need to make amends. This deficit model has very negative consequences for black migrant and refugee students and teachers because they are forever deemed to be not good enough. Um, they are easily inferiorized. Um, Philomena, uh, when we had this conversation on March 4th, mentioned an example that she had made a very good um, paper, and then um, afterwards it was questioned where, whether she had really written this paper herself. And I could come up with myriad examples that I have experienced myself ever from being a first year student until uh, including also being a professor of how systematically one is undervalued. Um, uh, the immediate reaction that people have to someone of color in the academy is, um, well, when you're doing your work right, you cannot have done that by yourself. Um, are you really a professor? Aren't you just appointed for appearances sake? Um, in many different situations, I have also experienced that um, I'm taken to be the lady who takes care of the coats in the wardrobe or who is responsible for catering, for bringing out coffee and so on and so forth. Um, so, um, systematically, people of color are put in a lower bracket and they are not as far yet. And it is not hard to see how there is continuity from the colonial cultural archive that was implanted 400 years ago and these current patterns that we see popping up again and again. So what we see happening in the university is that the dominance of whiteness 
doesn't prepare people to be glad with the different angles and questions and methodologies and epistemologies that uh, black migrant and refugee students come up with because of their bilingualism and biculturalism. Uh, there is no kind of notion that there is value in the uh, baggage, the, the, the things that these students bring with them. Um, then the second process that I want to point to is that the dominant discourse of um, race doesn't play a role here, um, leads to practices of cultural cloning and uh, Philomena Asset and David Theo Goldberg have also written about this. If it is the sitting staff that represents uh, merit, intellectual creativity and skills, then that leads to the reproduction of the same kind of person under um, scientific personnel, but also <coughs> under staff and students. Um, Asset and Goldberg say, one can imagine who will be cloned. Male, white, able-bodied, heterosexual, highly intelligent, to be placed in economically privileged habitats. Um, this is also uh, uh, an issue that I uh, recognize uh, very clearly how this has played a role during my entire career. Um, when I was a second year student in anthropology, I did a, um, an exam with a Professor Wertheim about uh, Indonesia and that was reading lots of books, unlike what you're used to nowadays. We were reading like about 10 books for this um, oral exam, and I did really well. I even remember the only question I missed during that exam, and I got a 9 out of 10, which is pretty marvelous. Um, so then, when the time came up, there's um, new student assistants were to be um, assigned, I naturally thought that I would stand a good chance of getting a job as a student assistant. Um, not so. Uh, the, the only student assistants at that time were white, white males, of course, according to the uh, principle I've been outlining here of cloning, cultural cloning. You want to see in the next generation people who look like you, who act like you, who do everything the same way you've been doing. So there should be more cultural reflection on the cultural investment and the normativity of the same. What are the images of the talented academic that circulate? Which assumptions, which assumptions with regard to gender and ethnicity are woven through those images of the talented researchers. Um, and um, um, it would be good to step outside those exclusivist um, presumptions. The third part, that is towards a decolonial university. I think my uh, broadest aim has been, when I was working at the university, to strive for a form of sustainable education, decolonial education, that is, education that commensurately benefits different groups and categories within the population, and that gives equal chances to the next generations. So we should strive for gender-conscious decolonial education. And this is not only a question that matters to black migrant and refugee students, but it also has consequences for white students and teachers and for the organization as a whole. Students of the future 
will have to function in a very diverse society, both as far as gender, as uh, class and race, ethnicity is concerned. But they are still being educated in a curriculum, in a canon that is monoracial, monocultural, and uh, mostly monogendered. So one of the very key questions that any university should ask itself is what kind of knowledgeable people do we want to produce and do we want to educate for the society that is coming, for the society that has been forming during the past seven decades in which gender equality, sure, is important, but in which we also finally should start looking at racial equity. Which are the skills and the knowledge that our students of today have to uh, have in their fingers to be able to contribute to society as people will be in the lead in future, whether it's as, as judges, as professors themselves, as linguists, as people working in health, it is important to be aware of how gender and race in their intersections work. And um, if we want to uh, avoid the intelligentsia of the future to still be so split up along, along lines of gender and race, we really uh, should have been acting.